It's the 30th of March 1997 and we're in Ballymac in County Cork and we're talking to Pat Duggan. How are you Pat? Hello. Um, you've lived in this area most of your life? Most of my life, yes. And were you born here? The, um, I was born within 12 miles of this place. And is that a few years ago? Oh, more than I'd like to say. Call it 70, 80 years ago. And times were different then and things were different. Can you remember back that far? Only they can. I can remember the last of the military here in Ireland, of the English military. Y you can remember the black and tans? I can, yes. And we hear a lot of stories about the black and tans. Like, in your memory, what sort of people were they? Well, they travelled in what was known as Crosley Tinders. They, they always went in a crowd together. You never see a single black and tan because they wouldn't dare go out alone. There were dangerous times, and uh, you had our old IRA here watching for them. And would they regard everybody in Ireland as an enemy of them? They would. Uh, and uh, you see, the Black and Tans were actually fellows who were released from jails in England. And uh, they came across here, and uh, they were given liquor uh, to, to know in the, at all. And uh, they were mostly drunk when they went around, and a lot, a lot of them would be left loose upon a village at night. And uh, they, they could do anything. And there were lots of all the surveyors. They had guns, and the people had no guns. And I've heard them stories before. Hearing them from you, that's true. It wasn't just Irish propaganda to oh get no. the people turned against them. Oh, no, no. That is why the whole system failed, because they overdid it, and eventually England had to withdraw them. Some of your earliest memories there were of the black and tans. That would be when you were going to school, would it be? Yes, and before it. And what was school like for you here in this part of Cork? Oh, well, the old national school system. Three teachers with three large canes, about four feet long. They said the national teachers that time were tyrannical uh, in every school. Compared to now, kids have it easy. Oh, it's different altogether. You see... They, they were such tyrants as that uh, the government had to take the sticks out of their hand altogether. And now it's gone completely the other way around. It's, it's the teachers, it's the pupils now that are hard on the teachers. And Pat, you yourself ended up a teacher and you were telling me there earlier you taught in some unusual places apart from Ireland. Can you tell us something about that? Well, I was stationed out in Papua New Guinea. Now Papua New Guinea and the Amazon Basin are supposed to be the two most primitive lands on earth. Now, I was stationed away in the interior of Papua New Guinea in a place called Mount Hagen. Now, to give you an idea how primitive the people were there, 1940 was the first time a white man set foot on where I was in, Pat in Papua New Guinea. And 1940 is not so long ago. Now, when I went to school here in Ireland, we were always afraid of hell and we were always talking about heaven. And I often thought when I was young that it would be to be a pagan. That the pagans had nothing to worry about. They had, they had no hell to be, to be thinking of. But when I went out to Papua New Guinea, I found the very opposite. I found that there were pagans out there. And they were, they were completely uh, advanced as to what was to become of them when they would die. They had spirits and gods that uh, you'd, you'd, you'd be amazed of, of how they were able to sleep the night. Now, uh, you could listen to the young fellows telling yarns, and uh, they'd be the wildest yarns you ever heard of. Now, they, they had a system there that when a person would die, they would put them on stilts, outside the door, the dead body, and it was just below the equator, and uh, the body would get putrefied after a few days, and uh, they all fought with bows and arrows there, and they would stick the arrows into the put putrefied flesh, and the dim arrows would then be poisoned. Anything that that arrow would hit would poison immediately. However, they got into that idea, the Indians in North America, they poisoned the tips of their arrows, but they did it with herbs, whereas the Papua New Guineans did it by, by sticking it into the putrefied flesh. Now they cut off the head, and the head, the heads were preserved, and the body was left rot, and the bones were thrown away. Now, when we in Mount Hagen, we tried to 
bring the people around to bury the people in coffins. And we had a vocational school and we made rough coffins. And uh, we gave the coffins for nothing to the people for to bury their dead in. But they would have to give some token, come for a day's work or something like that, in, in lieu of our giving them the coffin. But uh, one evening, two fellows came up to our school for a coffin, their mother was dying. And they went off with the coffin, and after two or three weeks, we had no more. We were wondering what happened. And uh, Brother John, he was a Christian brother from, from Holland, he went down to the village for to find out what happened to the coffin. And when, they went, when he went into the cabin, they have no furniture there, the coffin was on the middle of the floor, and the old woman was inside in the coffin, and she laughing in great, spo in, in great joy. She refused to leave the coffin, she slept in the coffin, and she died a few months afterwards, all right. But that will give you an idea of how primitive those people were. That's fascinating, because I'd say most people, a lot of people don't know where Papua New Guinea is. You're the first man I ever met that's ever been there. And uh, Well, you go on out to Australia. I, I went out, I landed in Sydney. I came up the following day by plane up through Australia, about 3,000 miles up to Darwin. Then you go across the Torres Strait to Port Moresby. Port Moresby was the hottest place that I ever met. You have no idea of how hot it can be in a place like Port Moresby. It is like you were in a oven. You couldn't sit down even. Everybody had to stand up and try and keep shaking their shirt for to, to try to withstand the heat. The following day then, I was carted in a small plane into the interior. And in the interior where I was, it was up on a plateau, and that was a bit cooler. It, it was a, a better climate up there. <coughs> the people there, they practice polygamy. They have an average of three wives, each man. And uh, you would wonder, in a place like that, that you should have three times the amount of women as men if each man was to have three wives. Now, the same thing held out in Salt Lake City with the Mormons. They used to have four wives, and you say there should be four times as much women as men. If the men, if a man at any one time could have three wives or four wives. Now, if you met that out mathematically, it works out different. Because a man marries usually at the age of 28, and the girl is usually only 13 or 14. Now, after a few years, when he gets rich, and they measure the riches by so many pigs that they keep, and he marries again, and then after another few years, he marries again. He's, he's getting old now. Now, when he dies, there are three, three widows, and they must get married immediately, to, and usually to his relatives. If you're a brother unmarried or a first cousin unmarried, they're supposed to marry those girls. And the result is that during life, the woman is married three times, even though at any one time she has only one husband. Whereas the man, though he marries three times, at any one time he can have three wives alive. So mathematically, it makes sense. It makes sense. It, 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 it was so tough. Now, a thing now that you won't believe at all is a man doesn't sleep at all with his wife. Because uh, a boy is told from early on that if he loses any, he, he, he loses his, his, his senility he, he, if, 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 if he spends too long with a woman. The result is that for procreation, he'll just walk down the trail with his wife, but he won't sleep with the wife. And down in the village, they have a big long house called Horse Women, where all the women sleep and another big long house a hundred yards long where all the men sleep. And I was after school, a young fellow, the young fellows were are mad to speak, you see, with anybody that is white. And they make out that if there's a white man there, there were only a few white people there, that the white man must be a very rich man, and he must have an awful lot of wives. <laughs> uh, he asked me how many wives that I had. He made out I should have a hundred wives. So I told him I had only one wife, that in our country we can have only one wife. And I said, how many ways have your father? He has three. And how does he manage them? Well, one day he has been with my mother. Mark very carefully in one night at all now because the night is out. And the next day he has been with the next wife. And the next day he has been with the next wife. You see, when he gets married, they build a house in a day with bamboo and coney grass. And the wife lives in that house. And she uh, has a garden out at the back. And to she that 
keeps the house in food. And then when he marries again, another house is built, and he and the other wife will live in that house. And then when he gets married again, another house is built. So he'll go from house to house. By God, says I, the young fellow, he must be a great whore. Of course, the young fellow wouldn't understand that word, you see, and I, I know that. And then there'd be a big, big laugh. <laughs> People listening to this, they think because of your age that, that's, that you're talking about in the past, but that's quite recently you were there. That's, that's only 12 years ago. And it's still the same, life hasn't changed oh, yes. out there right now? No, no, no. Uh, attempts are made, of course, but uh, uh, you have several religious sects uh, out there. Uh, names that I never heard of until I went out there. Seventh-day Adventists, Nazarenes, all those religions are out there. And uh, when you set up there, you always give some surface to them. Now, near us now, there was a Methodist uh, church and uh, run by two doctors from America. They were qualified doctors, and they were also preachers in the Methodist church. And all day long, they held clinics, all free of charge, of course. We, uh, Catholics, ran our business, but also it was a school. We gave them schooling for nothing. And are they trying to change the lifestyles of the people out there? Yes, but unlike Africa, uh, a strange ship of Papua New Guinea is that it is back, it's going as far as the influx of white people are. In, in, in other words, there are less white people now than what there were 20 years ago. The white people are deserting it, if you wish. They'll give it up for a bad job. And I think personally that the blacks themselves are nearly better off to be left to themselves. You think they shouldn't be interfering and bringing Western ways to their culture? Uh, Captain Morsby in 1775, when he entered Port Morsby, uh, he said, when he looked out and he saw all the coloured people outside and they were the first white people, he said to one of his mates, he said, those people would be better off if they never saw us. And I think that's been proved a lot of times in history, hasn't it, in various countries? It is true today. And Pat, you have a few interesting stories from Papua New Guinea. Ah, you'll see that every day. Uh, in the morning there now, the mornings there are wonderful. The 365 days of the year. All the very same. Beautiful sun in the morning, and you'll see where the webs are on the grass down along, like a beautiful summer's morning here. Well, now it's like that up to 10 o'clock. But uh, a young fellow would come in there in the morning, we'd start school at 8 o'clock, and while he'd be waiting for school, you'd see him, you get a cockroach and a mouse trap, a, a homemade mouse trap at that. They're very handy. Down to the river, and he'll be back in no time with a kingfisher. The kingfisher knows a small bird the size of a robin. And then, with two pieces of bamboo, he'd, he'd make a flame with grey grass. And he'd be plucking the little bird whilst this would be the, And then he'd hold the bird over for a bit, and then into his mouth the whole bird. And that was his breakfast? That was his breakfast. A, a kingfisher that he was after catching a few minutes before that? A few minutes before that. And then, when we'd go to school, then, while I'd be giving a class, a young fellow would be appointed to be at my back to keep off the mosquitoes because it's a malarial place 